On my recent video about the new PreSonus Quantum ES2 interface, viewer DudeMaster8575 commented, sadly, that company makes the same product in a different package. It's just an audio box with loopback without the direct mix knob. Well, you know what I'm trying to say? I am the walrus. So this is why I like to open stuff up in videos, and honestly, I should have done it in the first video, but we'll do it here today and we can figure this out together. Now, some of you will remember when I took apart the PreSonus R65 V2 monitor speakers back in video number 236, that they were rather curiously filled to the brim with PreSonus Aris speaker components, which are a less expensive line of speakers they make, and they had reused components in the R65 V2 from the PCBs to the power transformers from the Aris line, so there is precedent for what Dude Master is suggesting. So let's open up the Quantum ES2 and see. I can't answer the question, you know, off the top of my head. I want to ask the question is how many changes does a company have to make to a product before it's a new product? Because obviously a company like PreSonus is going to make new audio interfaces and they're not going to go back to the drawing board and design new mic pre's from scratch every time. So they're going to use some in-house intellectual property and they're going to continue to reuse designs. I feel like you can draw the line at, you know, what work is done to change the product fundamentally. If you've got a ton of power transformers sitting on the shelf from the Aris line of speakers and you've found a way to repurpose them in a other speaker that's fundamentally more expensive for other reasons, you know, there's no harm there. And similarly, we can look in this unit at what's gone on and decide for ourselves if we think it's just a reboxed audio box. So I'm back now having had a look at this. It's a little difficult to get the close-up camera shots and narrate and talk at the same time. But uh, first thing I'll say is taking it apart was easier than I thought. The four screws on the bottom release from the standoffs inside. And then you just have to be really careful about these ZIF connectors. Just pop them open before pulling the two halves apart uh, too far. Otherwise, you'll definitely do damage. Uh, those are always delicate. But with those two ZIF connectors undone, the two halves come apart and we can see that the two main PCBs on the lid and in the actual interface itself were designed from the ground up. These are 2023 designs, it looks like, and they've gone through multiple revisions. You see revision C on this one and then the top case board ended up being revision B that I got. And again, both of those 2023 copyright on the layout and design. So. These are new products. These are uh, different than the audio box, and I'm sure they use some of the underlying technology, but uh, you know, adding loopback is not a trivial thing. That's not just a couple of jumper cables under the hood, and getting rid of the direct mix knob and going to a completely software-driven solution, again, not something that you just like bodge together. That's new product territory in my mind. Taking a quick poke around, we can see an MXR T1061 ARM chip, and that's a Cortex M7 600 megahertz processor with one megabyte of RAM on board. We can also spot an AKM4621, 24 bit, 192 kilohertz, two channel ADC and two channel DAC all in one. Although right above that is an AKM AK4490 REQ dedicated 32 bit stereo DAC, which appears to be feeding the main TRS outputs. Without going into the input circuitry, uh, we can just compare to the audio box that this is a three input unit, the high Z input on the front and then the two combo jacks on the back. And those combo jacks have individually switchable phantom power, unlike the audio box that just had a single phantom power button. So the further we dig into this, the harder it is to make a case for this being the same product as an audio box. And I think the final nail in the coffin on that argument is that this is a 192K interface and the audio box, the most recent version, was only ever built to go to 96K. So fundamentally, they're just different products, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have any opinions, if you're an audio box owner, or if you've bought one of these new ES quantum interfaces, let us know what it's like with whatever software you use, because obviously that can be a big factor in your experience with any 
interface. Same thing with the computer. I'm on Mac here. I try to test stuff on Windows as well, but it's not the same thing as being a daily driver, uh, especially with all the various software that's out there. So let me know what you use your interfaces for, and I'll see you in the next one.